Welcome to the Christ Bible Church Bible study. Let's begin our study by looking to the Lord in prayer. Blessed Father in heaven, we thank you and praise you for this opportunity to study your word once again in this nation that is keeping freedom still open to its citizens and to the church. We pray, O oh God, that as we look into the book of Galatians today and continue to study it verse by verse, that your spirit would illuminate our minds, enlighten our understanding, challenge us to the depth of our soul. We do look to Christ today, praying for cleansing in his precious blood to sanctify us, to purify us. O oh Lord Jesus, hear our prayer as your church gathers to worship, whether it be in person or on Facebook or social media, we pray that you would bind our hearts together and that we would be as one as we approach your th throne of grace. Cleanse us, O oh God, and give us ears to hear what the Spirit is saying to the church and to each of us. Thank you for each one present today and to each one that is listening. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you've been following our studies, this is the second study on the book of Galatians. Today we will be looking at chapter 1, verses 6 through 10. So turn with me in your Bibles to Galatians chapter 1, and I'll begin reading at verse 6 through verse 10. I marvel that you are turning away so soon from him who called you in the grace of Christ to a different gospel, which is not another, but there are some who trouble you and want to pervert the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel to you than what we have preached to you, let him be accursed. As we have said before, so now I say again. If anyone preaches any other gospel to you than what you have received, let him be accursed. For do I now persuade men or God? Or do I seek to please men? For if I still pleased men, I would not be a bondservant of Christ. Let's briefly summarize the context and the chapter. Paul began his letter to the Galatian churches abruptly compared to his other writings to the other churches. He follows up his short greeting, which we looked at last time in verses one through five, and stresses the absolute uniqueness of the gospel of Christ in this next text, which we'll look at today in verses six through 10. He heard the Galatians, some of them at least, were deserting the gospel which he preached since they believed the good news that Jesus died to fully pay for all our sins on the cross. The Judaizers, the false teachers that were beginning to creep into the church, taught that these Gentiles must also follow the law of Moses and keep the law of Moses in order to be saved, and they openly questioned Paul's authority. Paul makes the case that He's been called and made an apostle by Christ himself, who appeared to him and revealed the truth to him apart from the other apostles. So with that review of the context in chapter 1, let's look first of all to Paul expresses his astonishment and assesses the situation, verses 6 and 7. Paul expresses his astonishment and assesses the situation. He says in verse 6, I marvel, I'm shocked, I'm surprised, I'm amazed that you are turning away so soon from him who called you in the grace of Christ to a different gospel, which is not another, but there are some who trouble you and want to pervert the gospel of Christ. As I mentioned last time, Paul confronts the Galatians right away at the beginning of the book on their readiness to accept error. He's amazed that they should so suddenly surrender the truth of the gospel. And he labels their action as deserting God 
for a false gospel. So not only does he dispense with the pleasantries at the beginning of Galatians chapter 1, but he rebukes them from square one by expressing his amazement that so quickly they're falling away from an accurate, firm belief in the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. It would be one thing if they had held on to the gospel in truth and conviction for decades, many, many years, but they were quickly falling away from the gospel. And their actions are viewed by the apostle as deserting God for a, for, for a false gospel. They were distorting the truth. They were misrepresenting the truth of the gospel to other believers in the Galatian churches and others. And so, from Paul's perspective, the Galatian believers, having been influenced by the teaching of the Judaizers, are in the process of defecting from or deserting the gospel. Now, this is a very serious charge. And this is probably in the top two or three applications, most relevant applications for the church today. There are so many professing Christians and evangelical churches that are not grounded in the truth of the gospel. They don't understand the basic elements of the gospel. And many of them do not only not understand the gospel, but they're not convicted about the very nature of how a person is saved. And so these Galatian believers, having been influenced by the teaching of the Judaizers, are in the process of defecting from the gospel. And this is very, very heavy. This has blown Paul's mind. And he sends them a sharp epistle. He cuts to the core. He cuts to the quick. But I want you to note the present tense usage of the term deserting in the original. This implies a process that has begun but is not final. They started this process of perverting the gospel, but Paul's aim is to arrest, to stop this process before it goes any further. Now, in verse 7, Paul clarifies his earlier reference to a different gospel by declaring that there's not another gospel other than the one that he received from the Lord. This term, different gospel, means it has nothing to do with the true gospel. It's another perverted form of the gospel, but not the gospel itself. Um, so, Paul makes a short assessment of the actions of the Judaizers. And he declares to the Galatian church that they're perverting the gospel. The Judaizers agitate the people and want to pervert and distort the gospel of Christ. But it's imperative, therefore, that we not lose the gospel, that we are not loose with our theology, but understand what we believe and why we believe it. One of the most neglectful things of many churches today and its teachers and leaders is to forsake grounding the people week after week in the basic doctrines of the Christian faith. We call that basic Christian doctrine, as well as all the elements of the gospel and the implications of the gospel. It's critical that the members of the church are established firmly in the gospel so that they can identify false teachers and false gospels when they're coming because it does matter what we believe. I see sometimes some of my friends, especially overseas, in churches overseas, in Nigeria in particular, many of the young men are, the zealous men, young men are wearing shirts that say on it, theology matters. And theology does matter, doesn't it? Because everything is built on top of sound doctrine. God has called the Galatians into the grace of Christ, but now they're putting themselves under the curse of the law. They accept the true gospel when they got saved, but now they're abandoning it for a different gospel, which is not the gospel, nor is it good news at all. It was just a perverted message because it was a mixture of grace and law. And that makes the 
deception more clever and more subtle, where a preacher can be out front with the grace of God, but then bring in behind that or weave it in uh, slowly or in a small way with the truth of the gospel, with a message of works or law keeping as a grounds for salvation. And so we see that Paul expresses his amazement at them. And he assesses the situation and he's very frustrated in a godly way at their situation. And then he goes on for the rest of the book of Galatians, beginning in verse 6 of chapter 1, all the way through, especially to the end of chapter 3, with a doctrinal reassessment of what the Galatians believe in the core doctrines, especially justification, redemption, reconciliation, adoption, and other core doctrines of the cross. And now secondly, in verses 8 and 9, Paul affirms the absolute uniqueness of the gospel of Christ. Verses 8 and 9, But even if we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel to you than what we have preached to you, let him be accursed. As we have said before, so I now say again, if anyone preaches any other gospel to you than what you have received, let him be accursed. Now Paul repeats himself in this curse twice in verses 8 and 9, and that is significant. Keep that in mind as we proceed. Verses 8 and 9 bring up to us the heart of this text, which is verses 6 through 10, and Paul's argument in verses 6 through 10. The integrity of the gospel was at stake in the Christian churches, in the Galatian churches in particular. Remember, there was more than one Galatian church. There were satellite churches surrounding this main Galatian church. And Paul affirms with powerful words here that are unmistakable, extreme words that are rarely used in the New Testament, like the word anathema, which is where we get the word accursed in the New King James or in the NIV. But Paul affirms that the gospel is not to be trifled with or changed. You and I as believers, are, it's incumbent upon us to understand the gospel and to defend it. We call this apologetics, the doctrine of defending the faith. And to be able to defend the faith in its core essentials, we need to understand the gospel. And it's nothing to kid about or to trifle with. The gospel cannot be changed. It needs no updates. The gospel needs no adjustments or improvements. We are, we are not to be creative with the gospel. We are to pass on the same gospel that Paul says in Galatians 1, 1 through 10, that he received from the Lord Jesus Christ. And we're to take that same gospel, preserve it, don't change it, and pass it on to the next generation. We're to teach that gospel in its fullness, in its accuracy, in its purity to new believers. And they are required to go out and to teach others also. As well as pastors and teachers and church leaders are to reaffirm. They are to reassess the state of the theology and doctrine of their church, especially the accuracy and faithfulness of the gospel message in their churches periodically. And whenever there would be membership classes, whenever there would be doctrine classes, the core gospel in its comprehensive nature should be taught. We should not leave out any elements of the gospel so as to please people or to try to attract larger audiences. So Paul here, as I mentioned, twice pronounces the solemn curse of God on anyone who preaches any other gospel, any other gospel in any way, even a variation of the gospel, which changes it slightly, but impinges and impacts directly on the nature of salvation is another gospel. God is only one message, one gospel for lost sinners. When we share it, we may not have time to share it in a, in a very expansive way, a comprehensive way, but whatever we do share concerning the gospel, we need to share as much of it as we can. And God's watching our motives because subtle thoughts can flash in our minds 
where we make decisions. I'm not going to share this part. I'm not going to share that part. I'm not going to share this part because it would be hard for the flesh, the natural man, to hear those elements of the gospel. Where to share the whole gospel, as, as much of it as we can, including the message of repentance, of judgment to come, and of the law, especially the law, because the law is the school teacher. It's the preparatory word that brings men to Christ. The law prepares people to hear the good news of salvation through Jesus Christ. If you eliminate that, most men are not sufficiently prepared to receive the good news, or they're very limp or apathetic when they do hear the good news. But to a convicted sinner who is broken and humbled at the foot of the cross because they've had a fresh or a first-time revelation of the vileness and the blackness of their sin, uh, that, that sinner who is under conviction of the Spirit will be looking for relief, will be looking for deliverance, will be looking for salvation with desperation. So the Lord offers salvation by grace alone, through faith alone, entirely from keeping the law. And so those who proclaim any other way of salvation, not only is it wrong, but Paul says that they're doomed. They're condemned. He evokes the highest level of condemnation to those who preach a perverted gospel or a distorted gospel. And that's why it's incumbent upon us at Christ Bible Church. Do you know what you believe in terms of the gospel? Can you recite five to ten different elements of the gospel, let alone two or three? Can you explain in two or three sentences to an unconverted person who has no background and no vocabulary understanding of the gospel what justification means? That's critical. It's important for us to understand that so that not only we can communicate it, but that we can have our Christian faith and walk and fellowship with God much more enriched and enlivened because the more we understand about theology and the doctrines of the cross in particular, like justification, like redemption, the, the fuller and more blessed our relationship with Christ will be, especially in worship and in prayer. If you have a very little understanding of these doctrines, your worship will usually proportionately respond in like manner. But if you have a huge understanding of the doctrines of Christ, the Holy Spirit just loves to draw from that, from that well of truth and information about what our Lord Jesus Christ did in atoning for our sins in the cross. He expands our minds and gives us liberty in our thoughts and prayer and worship and, and helps us to remember more of the fullness of Christ's benefits to us on the tree that he, where he died. And of course, our response with our affections and with our spirits and with our hearts is to worship him more fully and more deeply. How very serious it is to preach a message that results in the eternal damnation of souls. And that's what these Judaizers in Galatia were doing, causing other professing Christians to stumble because they were moving more towards works. They were moving backwards and not forwards. Paul was not tolerant of such false teachers, and neither should we be. One commentator says, we are not to be dazzled, as many people are, by the person, gifts, or office of teachers in the church. They may come to us with great reputation, dignity, authority, and scholarship. They may be bishops, archbishops, university professors, pastors, teachers, or other church leaders. But if they bring a gospel other than the gospel preached by the apostles and recorded in the New Testament, they are to be rejected. We judge them by the gospel. We do not judge the gospel by them. The messenger does not validate his message. Rather, the truth of the message validates the messenger. Now back in our text, I want you to notice that the apostle says, an angel from heaven, verse 8. Mm -hmm. 
he says, he doesn't say an angel from God. He says an angel from heaven, which could conceivably bring a false message. But not an angel from God, because if God sends an angel to bring a message, it will be the truth. Notice that in verse 8, Paul puts himself in the angels of heaven and the angels of heaven under the authority of the unchanging message of the gospel. What the angels say, what Paul says, is to be subject to the scrutiny of the gospel. And that's why those of us who have the stewardship of the gospel, whether you be a missionary like Brother G, Brother Mike, a teacher, Pastor Owen, myself, or anybody else, or even a believer just sharing the gospel, we have the responsibility to make sure we're not flippant with it, to make sure in our attitude, our character, and our demeanor, we express the gospel with the dignity and the seriousness that we have been taught that gospel and that it reflects to us. Our, our character and our attitude should reflect the seriousness of the gospel. And we should know what we're talking about. We should be ready to turn to chapter and verse and not just make something up because we don't, we, we don't know at the moment the answer to the question and we don't want to look stupid or we're so prideful that we, we can't say, well, I don't know. I'll get back to you on that one. It's okay to say, I don't know. But we should have an ammunition depot of scripture to back up what we preach and teach. Because even an angel from heaven could conceivably bring a false message, but not an angel from God. And in the end times, we're told in 2 Thessalonians 2, Matthew 24, that this worldwide deception that is being poured out upon the whole earth will be based on the fact, among other things, that people will not be grounded in the word of God so they can compare what they're hearing with the word to see if it's true or not because they did not receive the love of the truth. And the love of the truth presumes that you have a knowledge of the truth. See, love for something flows from and springs from a knowledge of it. Paul goes on to write that if we, including himself, or an angel from heaven should preach a gospel contrary or differently, let him be accursed. The word accursed is the Greek word anathema. This strong term means devoted or designed for destruction. Designed for destruction. Just like we read in Jude where the false teachers were aforehand designed for destruction. That's a scary thing. How is it then that so many false teachers today in the Word of Faith churches and in other cults and false Christian so-called churches can continue to teach the same distorted teachings for decades and not repent of those false beliefs and turn around and receive the truth. It's because they were ordained to that destruction. The specific language here in verse 8 and 9 could not express more clearly the uniqueness of the gospel. The true gospel is the only way of salvation. And there's only one true gospel. And it's our responsibility to make sure that not only the core of the gospel, but the outer fringes of it are also faithful to Scripture. Self-effort or human merit have no part in salvation. The gospel alone offers salvation without money or price. But the law has a curse for those who fail to keep it. God says, let them be accursed if we fail to preach the gospel. It grieves me when I see many who profess Christ have a lackadaisical and a lethargic attitude when it comes to staying on the razor's edge of knowledge and sharpness in understanding the gospel and in exercising their intellectual gifts with an ever-growing understanding and knowledge bank of the gospel to deepen 
that understanding and that truth in them and to widen it. The law has a curse for those who fail to keep it. And the gospel has a curse for those who seek to change it. And that's what Paul is saying here. If you try to take the gospel and change it so that it becomes a different gospel, then there's a curse connected with that as well. It's interesting that in verse 9, Paul repeats the same strong admonition that he said in verse 8. You'll know this, those of you who are Bible students, that repetition in a text or in a small context always draws our attention to the fact that God is emphasizing an important point. And obviously, it's understandable that with regard to the accuracy of the gospel, the Lord would want to make sure that this point is very, very specific and precise so that we cannot misunderstand it and we take to heart what he is teaching here and what he is warning us about here. Can you imagine if there was a looseness and some kind of leeway and liberty among teachers in the churches in teaching the gospel where there was a lot of freedom to change this or to kind of alter this, to adjust to a generation, to adjust to a particular context or a missionary field. The Jews did that with the Talmud. Each generation, they modified the Talmud, they added to their books of commentaries to adjust to the unique situation in their community, in their nation, in the language and vernacular of that particular people group. And so they got this huge, multi, multi-volume commentary called the Talmud, the Mishnah. And there were some rabbis, Jewish rabbis, who were the main writers of it, but there were many, many others who added to it afterwards. And you have this ever-changing liter literary document called the, called the Gospel. And that, wouldn't that confuse a lot of people if they were just simply looking for the truth on how to be saved and cut through all the morass of all this other information that has nothing to do with salvation. And so in his wisdom, the Holy Spirit laid it heavily on the heart of the Apostle Paul to be almost the main, not the only, but the main caretaker of salvation by grace alone, through faith alone, by Christ alone. The other apostles believed in this, but Paul went to Arabia after his conversion for three years and sat virtually almost alone, taking dictation, as it were, from the Lord Jesus Christ. And then he spent 14 years after that learning more and gaining experience as an apostle, taking the message that Christ gave him of the gospel and putting it to the test and preaching it. And as he learned more, he tweaked it until when he went up to Jerusalem to confer with Peter and James, he had a very, very precise understanding of the gospel. And he was deeply convicted about it. And there was only one gospel to Paul. There was only one way. Paul didn't go up earlier than that to consult and confer with the apostles to make sure they were all on the same page. Like Paul would say to Peter, hey, you say this, and then I'll say that, and I'll confirm this, and then I'll confirm. No. The same Holy Spirit who inspired Paul's epistles inspired Peter's epistles. The same Holy Spirit who enlightened Peter's mind and taught Peter about the truth of the gospel taught Paul. And they were all unified as to the essence of the gospel message. The apostles in Jerusalem did not hesitate to affirm Paul's gospel as absolute truth. As a matter of fact, we have no teaching in scripture where we find the apostles in Jerusalem correcting Paul um, the only thing we find is uh, a, a godly married couple pulling um, a famous teacher, uh, not Barnabas, but uh, um, Apollos aside and showing him the way more accurately. The only other form of correction when it came to the gospel was when Paul pulled Peter aside and had to correct him. But Peter knew what he was doing when he gave the impression to the Gentile believers that they also had to keep the law of Moses in order to be saved. Paul 
provided a very strong rebuke to Peter in front of other people. Because there's no leeway, there's no wiggle room when it comes to preaching the gospel. Now, when you approach missionary work or gospel evangelism, personal evangelism, with that perspective, in terms of making sure you are a defender of the pure gospel, you're going to bring down upon you and upon your head the wrath and the hatred, the rage and the malice of unsaved man. Or unsaved professing Christians who have filled so many of our churches with multi, multi chaff because they've never heard the balanced gospel with these other elements that have been taken out of it by fearful, timid, unfaithful preachers who want to please men and tickle their ears more than be faithful to God in preaching the true message of the gospel. So the idea here is that if any preaches a contrary gospel, and indeed the Judaizers are doing this, let him be accursed. You cannot get a stronger message of condemnation in the New Testament than what Paul says here. And he's addressing the church, the professing church. Over the last two years with the pandemic, the coronavirus, it has grieved my heart and Pastor Owen, we've talked about it, that so many believers have stopped coming to church and coming under the word in a consistent word, line upon line, verse upon verse, continually in Bible studies and in preaching and teaching of the word of God, putting themselves under that teaching to maintain continuity and consistency in their understanding on a weekly or every three or four days basis, corporately speaking, coming together and in their individual study to resurrect the memory of long-held doctrines and truths that they were convicted about. But because so many have abandoned the means of grace, both privately and corporately, because of the pandemic and its connected problems and chaos and so forth, a vast amount of Christians have become weak spiritually. They have forgotten, as 2 Peter chapter 1 says, that they were purged from their old sins. They didn't forget their profession. They didn't forget that they were saved. But truth needs to be watered like a plant if it is to continually bring forth fruit, as Psalm, said, Psalm 1 says. And you shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth fruit in its season. In its season, that is consistently. Its leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he does shall prosper. One or two verses earlier it says, Blessed is he who does not walk in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stand in the uh, path of the, of the deceitful, nor, but, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. And in his law he meditates how often? Day and night. Day and, night. and then the fruit will come. He shall be like a tree planted right up against that water, always bringing fruit because the word of God and its doctrines, its truth, is always being revived and refreshed in our spiritual memories. And the Holy Spirit is always revealing new nuggets of truth to us, which is expanding our baseline of information and knowledge, not only of the doctrine, but of the Lord himself, because the character and nature and being of God is taught to us and is expressed to us in the word of God. And the Holy Spirit is not pleased to circumvent that process using the Word of God as the teacher through various means in expanding our ever-growing knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ in our lives. So, anathema is used in the New Testament. And it comes from the Greek word anathema, meaning a person or thing accursed or consigned to damnation or destruction. It's used only six times in the Bible. The word anathema is usually translated as accursed, cursed, 
or eternally condemned in the more modern translations of the Bible. The NIV translates Roman 9.3 where the word is found as, For I could wish that I myself were cursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my brothers, those of my own race. Of course, Paul is referring to his Jewish brethren after the flesh. Here in Romans 9.3, the meaning has to do with more uh, with a person being consigned to eternal condemnation. It carries with it the idea of complete separation from Christ and his salvation. That's how important it is that we not only not distort the gospel, but we have zeal and we have conviction and we have a strong will, especially in these end times when a desire for those things will be diluted in the hearts and minds of many unsaved church members and weak and backslidden true church members, true believers, that, that we don't even get close to that line. Generally speaking, the most, most Bible scholars agree that the word anathema is best understood to mean that which is to be accursed, condemned, or destroyed. When the Lord says something is anathema, it's a serious matter. He doesn't say it that often in the Bible, but he does here. And so we're all caretakers of the gospel. How many books do you have in your library? Maybe a booklet, a pamphlet, a tract, directly or indirectly explaining the gospel. The gospel. I encourage you to go to firstlovepublications.org and order one of those publications for free and get caught up on some of the deeper truths of the gospel. Thirdly and lastly, Paul asserts his status as Christ's servant and defender of the one true gospel. Verse 10. Paul asserts his status as Christ's servant and defender of the one true gospel. Verse 10. For do I now persuade men or God? Or, or do I seek to please men? For if I still pleased men, I would not be a bondservant of Christ. Now in verse 10, we find Paul making a powerful statement. Paul's enemies accused him of changing the gospel message to suit his audience. So he asks, in effect, in insisting that there's only one gospel, am I trying to please men or God? Apparently, the Judaizers charged Paul with making the gospel too easy and being a man pleaser. Oh, Paul, you mean to tell me I can be saved just by believing in Jesus? I don't have to keep the law of Moses. I don't have to observe the, the three annual f f festivals within Israel. I don't have to offer my ble unblemished lamb to the priest who in turn offers it on the altar. I don't have to keep up with thousands of ordinances and Mosaic laws in the Old Testament. All I do is stay where I'm at. I don't have to go to the temple in Jerusalem and make that very long trek. I just stay here in my hometown and believe in the Lord Jesus Christ from my heart, believe that he rose from the dead, believe that he died on the cross to save me from my sins, and I can be saved? Yes, absolutely yes. So he doesn't water down the gospel to please men, although on the surface it seems like an easy thing to do. True salvation by grace through faith is impossible for the flesh to do. No matter how strong your mental or intellectual consent is to the doctrines of salvation, in your heart, where it really counts, you cannot be saved, you cannot be converted and changed into a new creation in Christ unless the Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, each does their part that was decided before the foundation of the world, the Father electing those who would be saved, the Son dying for them and purchasing their salvation through His sacrifice on the cross, and the Holy Spirit effectually calling them into salvation. And if you call upon the name of the Lord, and you will find out whether or not you're one of them. But no one will call upon the name of the Lord consistently and not let God go until he or she is saved who has not been elected. So forget about that part if you're not saved. 
God will teach you all about that. All you need to know is God promised to save you. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. You focus on believing. And it's not your faith that saves you. It's Christ who saves you. But he still commands you to believe. Obviously, Paul here in Galatians 1.10 is not trying to please men, he says, because they hate the suggestion that there's only one way to salvation. You don't have to be a Christian for very long where the issue's going to come up. As you quote John 14.6, where Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes unto the Father but by me. And they come back with human rationale and human reason saying, Are you, do you mean to tell me that Jesus is the only way? That Muhammad or Buddha or one of these other religions are not also a valid way to be saved? And when you insist lovingly and gently insist that the Bible is the only truth and Jesus is the only way, you know what kind of reaction you get. You seem to them to be bigoted and unreasonable. But if Paul changed his message to suit men, he would not be a bondservant of Christ, as he says in verse 10. For if I still pleased men, I would not be the bondservant of Christ. And we need to decide as Christians that these subtle reasonings that take place within our hearts and minds as we share the gospel or contemplate the implications of the gospel as we come around family members and other close friends or co-workers and we delete certain aspects of the gospel because we don't feel at the moment we, we're in a mood or we're courageous enough to share the whole truth. Um, we, we need to make decisions about whether we're going to stand up for the gospel. Is there ever a good time to be persecuted for the gospel. Now, yes, we, we need to use discretion and wisdom, and sometimes it is not the right time to go more deeply into certain aspects of the gospel. But you need to be very careful as you make decisions about what elements of the gospel you're going to hold back on. In fact, Paul would be inviting the wrath of God to fall upon himself if he pleased men in his gospel witness. Paul responds with the assertion that man-pleasing and Christ-serving are mutually exclusive. So the farther away we get from the teaching, from teaching an accurate, faithful gospel, the more likely we can expect the wrath or chastisement of God. Let me just summarize the message and the text. The heart of this message is the double pronouncement of a curse on anyone preaching a gospel that is contrary to the gospel that the Galatian believers received from Paul, verses 8 and 9. In essence, Paul's strong language is confirmation of the absolute uniqueness of the gospel of Christ. There's only one gospel of Christ. It's unique. It occupies a place by itself, and we need to know its particulars and its core elements. This affirmation of the gospel is preceded by Paul's expression of amazement that the Galatian believers are moving away from the true gospel in verse 6, and his assessment of the situation in the churches of Galatia. The Judaizers are troubling believers and distorting the gospel. Verse 7. And finally, Paul's affirmation is followed by a strong assertion in verse 10, in which he rejects the accusation of being a man-pleaser and identifies himself as Christ's monster. So by way of application, are you guarding the teaching, the true teaching, or I should say, are you guarding the true gospel of grace against the false teaching of grace plus works in our churches and our individual beliefs? Do you remember the confession that was the result of the doctrinal battle of the Reformation? This concise confession, confession is referred to as the five solas of the Reformation. Sola Christus, Christ alone. Sola Scriptura, 
scripture alone, sola fide, faith alone, sola gratia, grace alone, sola dea gloria, to the glory of God alone. Did you know what they meant before I shared that with you? And so you and I need to assess, listen, we need to evaluate our loyalty to the gospel of Christ. You may know a lot of the gospel, but are you loyal to it? Because it's only when we're around people, when we're challenged to give a testimony of the gospel, a recounting of the gospel, a recapitulation of what the gospel teaches, that our throats will begin to swallow hard, that in our hearts and in our convictions we'll be challenged. Because the result of being loyal to the gospel may bring persecution down on your head. And so have you been faithful to the truth of the gospel? When was the last time you defended a grace alone gospel to anyone versus grace plus works for salvation? The apostle said in Romans 1.16, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. Now listen, the righteousness of God which is required for salvation will not come to anyone who does not have a grace alone through faith alone by Christ alone gospel message. If it's mingled, if the gospel is mingled with works in the smallest way, even 0.0001 out of 100%, God will not hear the prayer of that person, save me. There's no such thing as cooperating with God in our salvation. God, you do 99% and I'll do the 1% because I'm not, bad of, I'm not that bad of a guy after all. Don't be ashamed of the gospel. The gospel alone is the power of God. Wherever the gospel is spoken and preached and shared and defended by someone whose heart is right with God, you can believe the Holy Spirit at some point in some way will come down in power and reveal the righteousness of God in Christ to that person where the attention and spotlight will be taken off of you and all the instruments of delivery of the gospel to that person, and they will be riveted on Christ and their need of the righteousness of Christ, 100% to be clothed in the righteousness of Christ. Remember what Peter said in 2 Peter 2, 1 through 3, but there were also false prophets among the people, even as there will be false teachers among you, who will secretly bring in destructive heresies, even denying the Lord who bought them, and bring on themselves swift destruction. And many will follow their destructive ways because of whom the way of truth will be blasphemed. There's a lot in here, but suffice it to say, these are not true believers, even though it says the Lord who bought them. We're talking about a profession of faith. And these false prophets have plagued the church. But in the end times generation, just prior to the second coming of Christ, the church of the Lord Jesus Christ will once again, just like in the first century, be, be bombarded with and inundated with false teachers. False teachers. And therefore it behooves us to stand fast. Stand fast. Be anchored in the gospel. As Jude 3 says, Beloved, while I was very diligent to write to you concerning our common salvation, I found it necessary to write to you exhorting you to contend earnestly for the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. For certain men have crept in unnoticed. How could you not notice a heretic who preaches a works only or partial works in grace gospel? Who long ago were marked out for this condemnation. Ungodly men who turn the grace of our God into lewdness and deny the only Lord God, our Lord Jesus Christ. If you proclaim a works plus grace gospel, you trample underfoot the blood of the Son of God, as Hebrews 5 talks about. You diminish his death on the cross. You dilute the power and the glory of his atoning death on the cross. And you also rob God of his sovereign Ability and grace alone to save 
a never dying soul. You're suggesting there's a partial helper in the process of salvation. And so affirm your confidence in the gospel. And realign your ambition with the gospel. As Jude said, contend earnestly for this faith. And it begins with the gospel. Make every effort to come under the teaching and preaching and study of the word of God. Make it your, your main business every day to crack open this book, the Bible. And don't read it just to salve your conscience. You have certain filters and gifts God has given you. He's given you an intellect. He's given you a heart. He's given you a spirit. And when the word of God passes through those filters by faith and mingled with faith in Jesus Christ, the power of the word of God changes you. It informs you. It stirs up your love and affection afresh for the Lord Jesus Christ. With that in mind, let's close in prayer. We thank you, Heavenly Father, for your gospel. We thank you that your spirit and faithful teachers have taught us your truth, your gospel, through the years and have helped to ground us in the gospel. We don't take that for granted, Lord, moving forward, but we pray that you would help us to be lovers of the truth and that we would defend the truth and cling to the truth and never forsake it or renounce it or be ashamed of it. Help us, especially in these end times that you already told us, the masses and the multitudes in churches will forsake the truth and will be condemned because they did not receive the love of the truth. Oh Lord, please help us. Please, as only you can. In Jesus' name, amen.